Freedom has been under assault in America for a decade or so. Uh, we criticize that a lot. I'm going to skip over uh, most of that decade and just start by discussing what was going on a few years ago in American politics. I think that you would say that from 2006 until 2008, all the energy in American politics was on the left. People wanted Bush out. They wanted the Republicans out. They wanted a change in Washington, and they got it. And President Obama swept in on a wave of enthusiasm and passed the biggest economic stimulus bill in history within a month of taking office. And about that time, between the financial crisis in late 2008 and the Obama victory, pundits were declaring the end of the Reagan revolution, the end of libertarianism, maybe even the end of American capitalism. And then suddenly, something changed. Right around February 2009, something changed. The energy moved from the left of American politics to the right, and specifically the free market right. It might even have started with the Cato Institute's full-page ads against the stimulus that ran not just in the major Eastern newspapers, but in newspapers all across the country. And I think those ads sent a signal to small government supporters that after eight years of slumber and six months of absolute horror, Small government people were back, they're off the canvas, they're fighting back now, and it's time to get back in the game and take on these programs. The ads didn't stop the stimulus, but they did revive the small government movement. A couple of weeks later, Rick Santelli made his rant on CNBC, called for a Tea Party. Tea Party started uh, cropping up all over the country. And looking at what was going on there, a journalist wrote, the philosophical casualty of the Great Recession was supposed to be libertarianism, but signs to the contrary are thriving. Americans are increasingly opposed to activist government programs. The most significant social movement of 2009, the Tea Party protests, grew out of that opposition. The Obama administration brought with it ambitions of a resurgence of FDR and LBJ's active state liberalism, and with it, Obama has revived the enduring American challenge to the state. You could see throughout 2009, people were talking about how sales of Atlas Shrugged were soaring, sales of the road to serfdom were soaring during that period, and still. Polls right now are showing a lot of opposition to activist government, to the health care bill in particular, and to Democrats running for office in November. One of my Favorite polls that I keep following, pollsters ask a question of, of voters a lot. On the whole, would you prefer a larger government with more services or a smaller government with fewer services? The Washington Post finds that from the time Obama won the Democratic nomination until today, support for smaller government in that question has risen by 20 points. Um, or maybe it's risen by 15 points, but the margin is now 58% for smaller government, 38% for larger government. But what the major pollsters rarely do, when you ask that question, do you like larger government with more services, you're telling them the benefit, as most people see it, to larger government, that you get more services. You're not telling them that the cost is higher taxes. The cost might also be inflation, higher borrowing, etc. But at least, let's say taxes. A few pollsters, notably Rasmussen reports, ask a smarter question. On the whole, do you prefer larger, actually Rasmussen doesn't even say larger government. He says, on the whole, do you prefer a more active government with more services and higher taxes or a smaller government with fewer services and lower taxes? And when he asks that question, he gets 66% for smaller government, 22% for a more active government. I would like to see other pollsters emulate that question. So I think that's important to us. But social movements, politics, polls, that's all politics. And what's more important, at least to us in this room, is to develop and promote the principles of limited government. And in that regard, we cannot expect politicians to lead us. It's up to us to do that. And the first task is to ask ourselves, what is it that we stand for.
And I like to say, uh, using a phrase from Adam Smith, we stand for the simple system of natural liberty. The idea that no one has the right to initiate aggression against the person or property of another. This is not just a matter of utilitarianism. The Wealth of Nations is largely a utilitarian book. It tells you that if you want your nation to be wealthy, follow these rules. It's not just about better outcomes. For us, it is not just economics. It is a moral principle, a principle rooted in the dignity of human beings who deserve to live under freedom and limited government. That is what we believe in. Shortly before he died, I was privileged to have lunch with the longtime Washington journalist Robert Novak, who had just published his memoirs. And one of the things he told us there was that when he gets invited to speak to, uh, to give commencement addresses, which he pointed out he got at about the rate of 1% of liberal TV pundits, uh, but he had done a few commencement addresses, and he said, I tell the students, always love your country, but never trust your government. That is a good rule, especially for American libertarians who live in a country that is indeed lovable, but that, like all countries, has a government that deserves to be watched. And sometimes, to us, the task of advancing freedom seems overwhelming. But let me tell you about some people who took on a far more fearsome state than our own. The story starts about 30 years ago. In 1978, it was proposed to place U.S. nuclear weapons in Central Europe. It's part of the Cold War, part of the constraint of the Soviet Union. And the East German Communist government encouraged protests against these U.S. missiles. Understandably enough, people started doing these protests. But the people who were protesting in East Germany started talking about broader themes of peace. They started protesting mostly in their Protestant churches, which were still allowed to exist, they began to pray for peace and to oppose mandatory army service and to oppose military classes in East German grade schools. And these prayers for peace became centered in particular on Monday evenings at the St. Nicholas Church, Nikolai Kirka, in Leipzig, the second largest city in East Germany. I had the privilege of visiting that a couple of years ago. This is a church where Martin Luther once preached against the autocratic church. These people started praying for peace. That was an approved topic. But some of the things they were praying for were not so approved, and under constant pressure from the government, attendance dwindled. As, many, as few as 10 people would show up in the mid-1980s for the Monday evening prayer services. But these churches were the only center for dissent in East Germany, and slowly attendance did grow. And then Gorbachev's reforms gave people hope that maybe they actually were allowed a little glasnost, a little chance to talk about change. And then on May 7, 1989, they held local elections in Germany, and people declared themselves volunteer election observers. They went out, they watched the elections, they then reconvened back in the churches. They compared results and discovered that they were fraudulent. Now, we would say, oh, communist elections were fraudulent. But this was the first time people had been in a place where they felt safe enough to say, I saw the results, I know what happened, compare them with each other and discover what they're announcing on TV is not true. And then... A few weeks after that, Tiananmen Square was a grim reminder to the Germans of what an authoritarian government was capable of when people protested it. And they began to fear a Chinese solution in Germany. But Gorbachev sent signals that the Soviet state was no longer prepared to intervene in the domestic affairs of its client states. And this was very important. Hungary relaxed its border restrictions in the summer, and thousands of Germans visited Hungary and then fled into Austria. And I can remember being in Europe that summer and reading about that and thinking, this could eventually be important. But I have to confess, I had no idea how fast it was going to become very important. More Germans went to Prague and climbed over the fence onto the grounds of the West German Embassy begging for asylum. 
And then after a summer break, and yes, even under communism and even during a simmering political situation, Germans still took a summer break, thousands of people showed up at the Nikolai Kirche on Monday, September 4th, and after the peace prayer service, they poured out of Nikolai Kirche and they marched around the ring road that circles the city of Leipzig. And a week later, the crowd at the, priest, at the peace prayers and on the march doubled. And in response to the people who were leaving Germany, those people chanted, Wir bleiben hier. We're staying here. That's our form of protest. Monday demonstrations were held at Lutheran churches across East Germany. 15,000 people showed up to march the next Monday night in Leipzig. And on October 9th, the police prepared to deal with 20,000 protesters. But as the crowd poured out of the church, there were more than 70,000 Leipzigers marching in some sort of protest against the East German government. And the minister of the church recalls 70,000 people who didn't know if they'd come home intact or see their families again. It was a heroic and enormous act of moral courage. And slowly, the crowd began walking around Leipzig's Ring Road, and the police looked to their commanders for instructions, and the police backed off. And that was the end, although it took a few weeks for people to realize it. The next week, on October 16th, it was 150,000 people. The week after, it was 300,000 people. People from all over East Germany joined the peaceful march in Leipzig. And then the party leadership fell. And on Saturday, November 4th, more than 500,000 people marched in East Berlin. The party leadership fell, but a new Communist Party leader was installed briefly. 500,000 people marched on November 4th, and five days later, the Berlin Wall the wall that was a permanent part of my childhood and my adult life, the wall that was built to keep people in, was opened. And the people of East Germany, millions of them, were suddenly amazingly free. And a few years ago, I visited Leipzig, and I had a chance to meet one of the activists who later became mayor of Leipzig, and I asked him, what was it like? And he said, from September 1989, as it says in the Bible, we walked seven times around the city, and then the wall came down. The minister of an East Berlin church who was involved in this whole process looked back on the events and said, no outside force could have done this. That would have meant war. Quote, what happened was a self-liberation. Soft water breaks the hardest stone. There is no army, no state, no government program that is more powerful than an idea and a movement whose time has come. And our ideas and our movement are based on an idea that is very radical, the idea of liberty, autonomy, individual rights, and limited government. And yet, this radical idea is very deeply rooted in Western civilization. As Brian Doherty wrote in his great history of the libertarian movement, the Western world now runs on approximately libertarian principles. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the dignity of the individual, private property, market relations, all imperfectly. From our perspective, very imperfectly but still approximately libertarian principles in a way that the history of the world would not recognize. This is a record to be proud of. Libertarians have been fighting ignorance, superstition, privilege, and power for many centuries, and we continue to do so. And when the New York Times reviewed Brian Doherty's book, they took a rather sneering tone and one of the things they said was, Doherty doesn't pay enough attention to the characters in the libertarian movement who have not shown much regard for the freedom of others. And then they detailed every example that the New York Times reviewer knew. And what did he come up with? He said, Ayn Rand testified before the House Un-American Activities Committee. 
Yes, she did. But that's kind of a rich charge coming from the uh, New York Times, which continues to boast of the Pulitzer Prize Walter Durante won for lying about the terror famine in Ukraine, and which is also still proud of its great reporter Herbert Matthews, who brought Castro to power in Cuba. It is true that Ayn Rand testified before the House on American Activities Committee. She told them about communist ideas that were being put into American movies. And you know one reason we know they're communist ideas? Well, she would say because you look at the ideas and you can understand them. We also know because the people who were writing these movies were actually members of the Communist Party. They were members of a secret conspiracy to destroy civilization. And it is true that she told a congressional committee about that, and she told them not to censor, that that is not the way you combat ideas. Second, they came up with Murray Rothbard supported Strom Thurmond for president in 1948 when he was 22 years old. Well, I grant you, that's embarrassing. And all those whose friends and forebears did not support the pro-Soviet Henry Wallace that year are entitled to criticize. And then they said Milton Friedman advised the dictator of Chile, Pinochet. Yes, he did. He spent 45 minutes with him giving him advice on how to save a struggling economy. And I would just ask the New York Times, would you prefer that no one give advice to the rulers of poor countries on how to make their countries richer? And if it was such a terrible thing to give advice to the dictator of Cuba, uh, of Chile, why was it not a crime for, for Friedman to spend much more time advising the dictators of China on how to improve their economy? And you know what? China's been the fastest growing economy in the world for the past 30 years, and Chile is the most successful economy in South America. So I think it's probably a good thing that Milton Friedman told these dictators your country would be better off if you let up in some of these areas. And I'm sure he also said, and you should have political freedom and free speech. That is a harder message for dictators to hear. And then the New York Times said, Doherty identifies a libertarian who was an anti-Semite. And I read this review and I said, I've never heard of this guy. Despite 30 years in the libertarian movement and despite having read this book, I've never heard of this guy. But I went back to the index, I looked it up. Indeed, there was a reference to this guy. And do you know what the reference was? It was an article, it was a line that said, Leonard Reed, one of the actual founders of the libertarian movement, warned people to stay away from this guy because he's an anti-Semite. So that was the the extent of anti-Semitism. Libertarians said stay away from people like that. And I have to tell you, if that is the sum total that the New York Times could come up with of embarrassing libertarian moments over the past 70 years, it is a pretty darn good record. Think about the records of other ideologies. Modern liberals, for instance. Modern liberals have to deal with the fact, not an embarrassing fact, but a shameful one that many of their forebears supported Stalin and the Communist Party, or were at least fellow travelers. And is it because they didn't know what was going on? Well, possibly. If they only read Walter Durante, perhaps they didn't. But if they read any other American newspaper, they could have found out. And as one of the great American communists, Eugene Genovese, said, we knew it all, and we knew from the beginning. And then as for conservatives, I could mention their long resistance to liberty and equal rights under the law for blacks, women, gays. But instead, I'll just say George W. Bush and the Iraq War. In 70 years, libertarians have done nothing to compare to expressing support for limited constitutional government while also supporting Bush, his disastrous war, and his accumulation of presidential power to the extent that in February 2008, when 3,000 conservatives assembled in, Amer in, in Washington for their annual conservative political action conference, they greeted President Bush in 2008 with chants of four more years. They wanted four more years of that. I think that libertarians, by comparison, have a record to be proud of, a record to build a movement on, and I thank all of you for supporting our efforts to advance those ideas and build that movement. Mm -hmm.